So good day, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce you to another webinar on Friday. This time, we have a great subject. My name is Christian Zossa. I'm the astronomer in charge for our telescope. And with us today is Rowan Hager, and he is from the University of uh, Waterloo, and he originally is from Nottingham. And um, he's a postdoc fellow there, and he has a very interesting subject. It's all about the universe in the computer where we're all staring into. So, Rowan, welcome to iTelescope, and we're very pleased to have you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, okay, well, we can get started. I've got some slides, so I will share my screen quickly. Sure. Um, okay, I hope you can see that all right. Not yet. Yep, okay, perfect. All right, uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Christian. Hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be here speaking with you all today. Um, as Christian said, my name is Rowan. I'm here at the University of Waterloo, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the role that simulations play in astronomy. Um, so I'm here in the Waterloo Centre for Astrophysics, and there's a whole bunch of other people here who are really interested in how simulations can be a really useful tool in astronomy and astrophysics, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to convince you all of that today. Uh, before I get into that, though, I just want to talk about myself a little bit, just introduce myself properly. So I've previously spent time at Durham University and the University of Nottingham, both in the UK. Uh, Durham and Nottingham are both wonderful cities, and if you ever have the chance to visit either of them, I would strongly recommend it. And then in the last few months, I've just started working as a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Waterloo in the Waterloo Centre for Astrophysics. Um, Waterloo doesn't quite have the same amount of history as Durham or Nottingham, but it's got a lot of geese that live here, and that is almost as exciting in my opinion. Um, here at Waterloo, I mainly work with simulations, which is why I'm speaking about these today. Uh, my research mostly focuses on looking at simulations of groups of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. But I also spend a fair bit of my time doing science outreach. I'm in charge of the uh, outreach for the Waterloo Centre for Astrophysics. And that means we get to do a whole bunch of really exciting stuff. One of my favorite things is we've recently very kindly been donated a portable uh, six meter diameter planetarium, which is up here in the top right of the screen, which we take around to schools and groups of scouts, things like that, project the stars onto the inside of it and tell them about all the really fun things that you can go out and see in the night sky. <clears throat> anyway, I won't talk about myself for too much longer, but as I said, I am a simulator. I mainly work with simulations. There are advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, one of the disadvantages, in my opinion, is that a lot of my colleagues uh, get to spend much of their time visiting places like this. Uh, these are some of the biggest telescopes on Earth. We've got ones from the Canary Islands, from Chile, from Hawaii. And these are the kinds of really exciting places that observational astronomers get to go and visit. Unfortunately, as someone who primarily works with simulations, I tend to spend a lot more of my time kind of like this. Uh, it's not quite as glamorous as standing up on top of a mountain in Hawaii, but it's still really exciting. And I, I think it's a, a great area of astronomy to be working in. But before I really get into talking about simulations, I want to take a, a bit of a step back and talk about something a little bit, a little bit broader within astronomy. Um, I want to start with this picture here. This is a picture of the Whirlpool Galaxy from about 1850. This is a hand-drawn picture from, a, from an astronomer called William Parsons. Now, he looked at the Whirlpool Galaxy through a telescope and then drew by hand the features that he could see in it. What I've also got here is another picture of the same galaxy. This is still the Whirlpool Galaxy, but this is taken with the Hubble Space Telescope about 150 years later. And I really love the comparison of these two pictures for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it shows us just the amazing progress that has been made in astronomy in the last 150, 200 years. All right, we've gone from these hand-drawn hand pictures to these incredibly detailed photos where we can see individual clouds of gas and these tiny little star-forming regions within a galaxy. But what I also like about this picture is that if you kind of use your imagination a little bit, these two galaxies do look the same, really. This galaxy has not changed at all in the last 150 years. In both pictures, you can see kind of two main big spiral arms coming out from the center. You can see this sort of big bright region in the middle of the Whirlpool galaxy. And then on the top right of the pictures, you can see this sort of smaller companion galaxy that seems to be interacting with it somehow. 
And so what this tells us is that in the last 150 years, this galaxy hasn't changed very much at all. Uh, its evolution is incredibly slow. Any processes that change the way this galaxy looks happen on really long time scales. And to be honest, if there's one kind of message that I would like everyone to take away from this talk, it's, it's this rule, which I think permeates an awful lot of science, uh, which is that big things are very slow. This is the kind of the, the driving force behind simulations in astronomy, is that when you look at things on these large scales, things happen very, very slowly. Uh, what I really like about this rule is that this isn't just something that applies to astronomy, right? This applies to all other areas of science. If we look at animals, for example, we might look at the, the heart rates of different animals. Uh, if we look at very small animals like mice, they have very quick heart rates. You know, a mouse has a heart rate of about 600 beats per minute. Whereas a much larger animal like an elephant might have a heart rate of only 30 beats a minute, right? Big things are slower. This is the, the rule that goes throughout science and then humans are somewhere in the middle of these two. Now, the thing about galaxies is that they are much bigger than elephants. Uh, this is a artist's impression of the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we live in. Um, and we live somewhere around here. So inside this red circle, we have the sun, uh, the, the, the big star that is closest to us. And then we have the Earth and all of the other planets that are in an orbit around the sun. And then as well as the sun, there are billions of other stars which all make up the Milky Way galaxy. <clears throat> now, in the same way that the Earth is orbiting around the sun, right, it takes about one year for the Earth to make do one lap of the sun, the sun and our whole solar system and the Earth and all of the other planets are also moving around the Milky Way, as are all of the other stars in the Milky Way. They're all making these orbits around the Milky Way. But because this system, the galaxy, is much bigger than the solar system, it takes a lot longer for the sun and the Earth to do a lap of the Milky Way than it takes for the Earth to do a lap of the sun. How much longer is a question that I want to kind of pose to all of you. Uh, I think Christian has a, a poll that he's going to bring up in a moment for us. I want you to kind of cast your minds back to when the sun was last in this spot in the galaxy, you know, when, when the Earth and the sun had done one lap previously when we were back in the same spot. I want you to think about how long it's taken for the Earth to go right the way around the Milky Way and get back to where it is now. And cast your mind back and think about what might have been happening on Earth at this time. When the Earth was last in this part of the Milky Way, what was going on right here on Earth? Um, I've got some four options up here. Was it at the time of sort of ancient Greek philosophy? Was it when the first modern primates were appearing? Was it so long ago that it was when dinosaurs were roaming around the Earth? Or was it before the Earth had even been formed, like before the dawn of our solar system? I'll give everyone a, a minute or two to think about these. Yep, we'll give a minute. <laughs> By the way, uh, just remarking on this, this amazing sketch from Herschel of the uh, Whirlpool Galaxy, it's stunning how accurate it is. You know, it's uh, amazing, isn't it? And I yeah, you know, I'm not quite sure what was the telescope that this yeah. astronomer Parsons was using, but it was, you know, 1850, I think that image. Yeah, that's, from. it's it remarkably is. good. I mean, come on, it's, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, you yeah. Know, if you look at it, it's almost like he, he put it on an, on an image and then drew it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, um, I, I lined up the two, the, the Hubble picture and the, that drawing and they do, they line up perfectly over the top of each other. Even if you look really closely, there's a couple of like big stars that he's marked on there. And he's even got like the positions of these stars exactly, you know, bang on. It's uh, it's be very creative to be an astronomer back in the day. I, I think so too. And it's very difficult because you're looking at something that's exceptionally dark, right? Has very poor contrast uh, mm -hmm. because our eyes are just not good for this. So I'm, I'm just amazed. Yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's end the poll and okay. I'll, I'll let you, I'll share it and you can comment. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, there's a, there's a bit of an even split. So uh, just a couple of people think that it might have been the time of the ancient Greeks. A few people thinking maybe uh, around when the first primates were appearing. But most people, what we got 47% saying the time of the dinosaurs, 42% saying that it was before the earth was even formed. Um, You've done pretty well. I'm pretty impressed. It's not quite that long ago. Um, it is about the time when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. So it takes about 230 million years for the solar system to make one lap of the Milky Way. 
Um, so this is kind of the time of the, the early dinosaurs, right? I think the first dinosaurs appeared maybe 240 million years ago. That's um, incredible. By, by the way, Paul just gave a very good um, comment here, drawing of the Whirlpool Galaxy by William Parsons. So I have to correct myself, not Herschel Parsons. A third Earl of Rossi uh, in 1845 with a 72 inch telescope. 72 inch. Oh, okay. That's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty substantial telescope, actually. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so it takes about 230 million years for the uh, for the sun and the earth to do one lap of the Milky Way, which I think is amazing. You yeah, know, that's in, in the time that dinosaurs have evolved and have been wiped out and almost all of modern life has come into being and the entire of human history, the sun has just managed to do one lap of the Milky Way. That gives you an idea of just, just how long it takes for these things to happen. Um, I think the Earth is about four billion years old, so the Earth has done maybe twenty laps of the Milky Way since since it was formed, which is still not very many since you know before the Earth even existed. Um, okay, now uh, astronomers are interested in a whole bunch of different areas of space, uh, but something that is in common with a lot of different areas of astronomy is that we spend a lot of time figuring out how things change, how things evolve over time, how things form. Um, I've got just a few different examples here. So on the left, this is a protoplanetary disk. So this is kind of what we get when, when a solar system like ours is in its very early stages. In the middle, this is what we call a protostar. So this is kind of the, the precursor to a star like the sun. And then around it is this uh, disk of gas and dust and rocks and things that is all clumping together and will eventually form planets. Um, you can see some kind of dark rings in this disk. And this is where some very early planets are forming and they're kind of sweeping up all of the dust within their orbits. And you can see this is, this is where these planets are forming around this star. Uh, in the middle is a picture of the Orion Nebula. Um, this is something within our galaxy, but it's this huge, huge, great cloud of gas. Uh, these clouds of gas are sometimes, sometimes called stellar nurseries. Uh, because this gas, mainly hydrogen gas, is the material from which stars form. And so these big clouds of gas are places where lots of new stars are, are forming within our galaxy. And then on the right is, the, is a picture of a galaxy cluster. And these are some of the biggest structures in the universe. Um, in the same way that a galaxy is made of billions of stars all held nearby to each other by gravity, a galaxy cluster consists of hundreds of thousands of galaxies that are all held in this big conglomeration through gravity as well. And different astronomers are interested in how these different things form and evolve. Uh, but the thing they have in common is, again, they're all very slow, right? Planets tend to form on timescales of hundreds of thousands or millions of years. The youngest stars might live for tens of millions of years. And things like galaxy clusters, because they're so huge, these form and evolve on timescales of billions of years. Now, Obviously, it's not very practical to sit down with your telescope and watch one of these things for a billion years. And so that's where simulations come in so handy. That's why they're such a useful tool, uh, because they allow us to fast forward time and to see how these things change without having to watch them for as long as they take to change in, in the real universe. Uh, I'm primarily going to be talking about the simulations of the biggest structures in the universe today. Uh, we tend to call these cosmological simulations. These are the kind of biggest simulations that astronomers tend to build. And because they're the ones that I work on, I'm a little bit biased, but I would say they're the most interesting. <clears throat> now, I've, I've kind of thrown this word simulations around quite a bit, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page of what I actually mean by simulations. Uh, and one type of simulation that a lot of people are more familiar with than astronomical simulations are simulations of the weather, of climate. Uh, these are used all the time and can sometimes be used to make uh, short-term predictions, such as, you know, what's the weather going to be like next week, or more long-term predictions, like what could be the impact of climate change. And these work in a very similar way to astronomical, sim astronomical simulations, right? We start off by taking some measurements of the state of the world now. We go to different places and we measure uh, air pressure and humidity and wind speed and temperature. And then we put all of this information into a computer and we run a simulation and it tells us what these things are going to be like in the future. What is the weather going to be like in the near or the further future? 
astronomical simulations largely work the same way, right? We start off with some information, we run our simulation, and then we see what is this system going to look like in the future. Uh, I've got an example of this, um, which is uh, the Milky Way and Andromeda. So Andromeda is the, the nearest large galaxy to the Milky Way. And in the fairly near future, in the next sort of few billion years, we think that the Milky Way and Andromeda are going to collide with each other and are going to merge together to make one new large galaxy. So what this, is, what this is here is a simulation of these two galaxies. This is the Milky Way that we're looking at now. And in, in a moment, we'll zoom out and you'll be able to see the Andromeda galaxy as well. And in this simulation, the, the astronomers that made this have done exactly what we do with the weather. They've taken the state of this system right now. They've taken the positions and the speeds of these galaxies and their masses and all of these different properties. And then they've put them in a box in the computer and they've pressed go and they've just seen what's going to happen. And so this is what we can expect to happen. This is kind of a, a space forecast for the next few billion years. The Milky Way and Andromeda will move towards each other and eventually they'll collide and we'll get this big mess where loads of the material will be flung out to far distances. And then eventually over the next few billion years, they'll kind of spiral in towards each other, gradually getting closer and closer until eventually they end up merging into this, this one big galaxy that's a result of the two. And so this is the kind of thing that simulations can tell us, right? They can make these forecasts for the future. They can show us what is a system like the Milky Way and Andromeda going to look like in the future. Um, one difference between astronomical simulations and simulations of the climate, though, is that this is actually not a very typical use for astronomical simulations. Uh, mostly when we run our simulations, we do them in order to look at the past rather than to look at the future. The, the way that we do this is we start off with something like what we're looking at now. Uh, so this is what we believe the universe looked like quite early on after it formed, maybe just 200 million years or so after the Big Bang. This is kind of the, the starting point for our simulation. And then we can run this into the future until we reach the present day. So that will give us an entire history of a universe inside of our computer. We can then play that. We can rewind it. We can fast forward it. And we can look at how this universe in our computer changes over the entire history of the universe. So this is the kind of thing that we see in simulations. We start off with this. This is sort of what the early universe looked like, where we've got all of this, these fluffy clouds of material, but not a lot of order, not a lot of structure. Then if we run our simulation, what we find is that gradually this material starts to clump together a little bit. Uh, so I should say this is from a, a very large, quite well-known simulation called the Millennium Simulation. And they looked at a huge region of the universe and they, they ran that through their simulation. And what they see in this is say that once we get to about a billion years after the Big Bang, which is what we're looking at now, all this material is starting to clump together. And then as we run our simulation further, we find that you start to get this kind of structure forming until eventually we reach this, which is 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, which is the present day. And so this is a simulation that has been run from the very early stages of the universe to the present day, and has shown us within this pretend simulation that is inside our computer, within this pretend universe, how do all of these structures form? How does all of this stuff come together um, to, to give us this final picture that we see at the present day? Um, <clears throat> This is a simulation of the cosmic web, uh, which is this huge network of these thin sort of filaments that spans right the way across the universe. This is absolutely enormous, this simulation. This is about a billion light years from one side to the other, right? It's, it's about 10,000 times the width of the Milky Way from one side to the other. This cosmic web is an unimaginably huge structure. And what it basically describes is the distribution of galaxies around our universe. So if we zoom into this cosmic web, you see all these kind of little yellow blobs in here. Each of these is a dark matter halo. And within each of these, we find a galaxy. So this cosmic web shows us within our simulation how a galaxy is spread around the universe. They're not just randomly scattered. They're in this very ordered network of structures that, that all links together. This is all well and good, and it's lovely to have a simulation that does this. 
What we need to do though, is to confirm that this simulation is actually realistic. And so to do that, what we do is we compare it to real observed data. We can go out with a telescope and we can look at the distribution of galaxies in our actual universe. Uh, this is some data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And if you kind of look quite closely at this, you can see that you can spot these filamentary structures, this cosmic web in this uh, SDSS data, this observational data. And so the fact that this looks kind of like our simulated universe, I mean, it's a little bit messier because observations are always a little bit difficult, but you can kind of see the similarities between the two. And so that tells us that our simulation is probably a pretty good representation of the real universe that we live in. What that means is that we rewind, if we rewind our simulation and look at the past, then that gives us a pretty good indication of what our universe that we're living in looked like at some point in the past as well. So that's kind of a, an, an overview of, of what these cosmological simulations are. The thing I'm gonna talk about next is how would we actually make one? If we wanted to go out and build a simulation ourselves, how would we do so? Um, I always think there's kind of three main ingredients in a simulation. Uh, the first one is matter. Uh, it matters that we have some matter in there. And the type of matter that we have in our simulation is also important. So what I've got here is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. I mentioned this earlier on. Uh, if we wanted to run a simulation with some galaxies in it or on an even bigger scale, simulating something like the cosmic web, we need to know what these things are made of. And luckily we do, that's something we can go out and measure. Um, what I've got here is a, a plot just showing the, the different components of the universe. What, what are the things that the universe is made of? And you can see that a big chunk of it is this dark matter here up in the top of the plot. And then just underneath that, you've got hydrogen and helium gas. This is also quite a big chunk of the stuff in our universe, this, this hydrogen and helium gas that's floating around. That is the stuff that stars are made from. Stars themselves are actually a pretty small part of what the universe is made from. Although they're very bright and they're what we can see in the sky, most of the material in our universe is not actually stars. And so when we run simulations, it's this dark matter and this gas that are the things that's really important for us to care about and make sure that we get right in our simulations. Um, the more eagle-eyed amongst you might have spotted that dark energy is quite a big part of our universe. Dark energy is included in simulations, but it's kind of a whole rabbit hole that I don't really want to get into right now. And so we're going to do what I always think it's best to do with dark energy, which is just pretend that it's not there and not worry about it too much. Um, so if we want to build a simulation, we need to make sure we have some dark matter and we have some gas in it. The problem is there is a lot of these things in the universe, right? If we wanted to run a simulation of a galaxy like Andromeda, uh, there are roughly this many hydrogen atoms in all of the gas clouds in Andromeda. Right? This is an awful lot of stuff. And if you wanted to try and put this many atoms into a computer simulation and press go on it, it's, it's completely unfeasible. There's no computer on Earth that could get even close to handling this. So the way that we deal with this, the way that we are able to run these simulations is we package this matter together. We take a bunch of hydrogen atoms and we say, all right, well, let's just because these are all quite near to each other, let's just assume that this is one big particle. And so we split all of the gas up into these different packages within our galaxy or within our even bigger simulation. And as long as we split it up into the right size packages, then it still acts kind of like how gas in the real universe acts. What that means is that when we look at a simulation like this, although it kind of looks like it's all these smooth clouds of material, it's not, these simulations are actually grainy. They're made up of lots of discrete particle, particles that are all floating around. Um, it's not these kind of smooth clouds like we'd expect to see in the real universe. Uh, the way I like to think of this is kind of like a photograph. That's the sort of analogy I like to, like to draw. If you look at a photograph from a distance, then it looks clean, it looks crisp, it's got sharp edges. It looks like the thing that it's a photo of. But if you zoom in far enough to it, then you start to see individual pixels. It looks blurry. It doesn't look like the real thing. And it's kind of the same case of simulations. As long as we, if we assume that these packets of matter are kind of like the pixels in our photograph, 
then as long as we have enough of them and as long as we're sort of looking at a large enough area with enough of these packets, then it looks like the thing that we're trying to simulate in real life. <clears throat> the other thing is that, so this simulation right here is just a simulation of dark matter. There is no gas in this. And this is quite a normal thing to do in the world of simulations in astronomy because most of the matter in our universe is dark matter. And so you can get a pretty good approximation for things by just including dark matter. If you want to start looking at galaxies, then, and you want to start looking at individual galaxies themselves, then you need to start including gas in your simulations. And if you do that, like is done in this simulation here, then your simulation can also form stars from this gas. And you can get these beautiful galaxies like we can see in the top corner here. This is one of the galaxies that has popped out from this simulation called the Eagle simulation. Okay, so that's the first ingredient. We need a bunch of matter. The second thing that we need is what we call our initial conditions. Uh, this here is a picture that some of you might have seen before. This is called the cosmic microwave background. What we're looking at here is a basically a, a map of the radio waves that are coming from space towards the Earth. This is a picture taken in all direction of the radio signal that's coming from the sky. And what this radio signal is, is basically the afterglow of the Big Bang. This is a map of what was going on in the universe very, very shortly after the Big Bang. Now we can use this information to try and figure out what the universe looked like in its very early stages. And that is how we get to these, this starting point of a simulation. We use this information from things like the cosmic microwave background, and that tells us, okay, we have all these packets of dark matter and of gas, but how are they distributed in our universe? How should we put them at the beginning of our simulation? Uh, this is kind of analogous to uh, going out and measuring the temperature in different parts of the Earth if you're going to run a weather forecast into the future. This is our starting point for our simulation. And then we can run our simulation into the future, and it ends up with something that looks like the present day universe around us now. All right, these are the first two things. The third ingredient that we need if we're going to build a simulation is some physics. Uh, this is a very important part, obviously. It's all well and good to have our packets of matter, and we know how they look at the beginning of the universe, but what we need to understand is how they change over time, how they interact with each other. And the main thing that drives this is gravity. We know if we have a bunch of material, then under gravity, it's all going to get pulled together. And so that's what we build into our simulations. We start off with all of these different packets of matter scattered around. And then over time, gravity pulls these things together, which is why we get this clumpy structure forming. And eventually, as we run our simulation further and further, we eventually get to the stage right in the present day where gravity has pulled all of this material together. And we've got these nice dense structures, these galaxies that form in our simulations. If you're running a simulation with gas as well, then you need some extra physics in there. For example, you need to look at the areas of your simulation where you have lots of gas that's all been squashed together by gravity. And these are the parts of your simulation where you're going to form lots of stars. These are the areas of your simulation where you're going to have things like the Orion Nebula, these stellar nurseries where loads of new stars are formed. And so that's it. That's how we build a simulation. Those are the three big ingredients we need. We need a bunch of matter. We need to know how it looks at the beginning of the universe and we need to know how it's gonna change over time. And if we put all of these things into a box in our computer and we press go and we've not made any mistakes, then what we should get out at the end is a nice simulated universe that looks something like the real universe that we can go out and see for ourselves. <clears throat> the final thing I wanna speak about is why should we actually care about this, right? It's that we now know what a simulation is and how you can build one. But why do astronomers bother doing this? It's a lot of work. Why are they useful? Uh, well, I think there's kind of three reasons, really, why simulations are so important. The first one is that they can tell us where we're going wrong. They can help us to spot mistakes in our understanding of the universe. Uh, what I've got here is quite an early simulation. This is from about 15 years ago now of a galaxy similar to the Milky Way. So in the middle, we've got this kind of Milky Way-like galaxy. And then around it, there's these hundreds and hundreds of bright points. Now, what all of these are, are dwarf galaxies. These are satellite galaxies that are all in orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. 
This is what kind of early simulations of the Milky Way predicted. But unfortunately, if we go out and actually look at the galaxies around the Milky Way, there are far, far fewer than what our simulations predict. Right, there are, there are still quite a few. There are maybe tens of these dwarf galaxies going around the Milky Way, but not the hundreds and hundreds that are predicted by simulations. And this was a problem for a long time within the world of astronomy and is still a little bit of an unsolved problem. Uh, this is called the missing satellites problem because there are all of these satellite galaxies we'd expect to find that are missing. So what this told us that we had to do is we had to change our theoretical understanding. We had to uh, come up with new ideas that would explain how these dwarf galaxies form, how they get destroyed over time, why there aren't so many around the actual Milky Way galaxy in real life. And so over time, we've tweaked our simulations and now modern simulations of the Milky Way look a little bit more like this, right? They look a lot more sensible, this one on the right. They look a lot more like the actual distribution of dwarf galaxies that we see around the Milky Way. And so this tells us that our theories have improved, right? We've come up with new ideas that better match the real world. These, these new theories of how these dwarf galaxies form and change over time more closely match the actual case of what's happening in the real universe. And without simulations, this would be a really difficult thing for us to realize. A, uh, a kind of subtly different thing that I think simulations are really useful for is to provide constraints on new physics. Um, a colleague of mine a little while ago said to me that uh, astronomers can't do experiments, so instead we do simulations. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think simulations are kind of the closest thing we can get to doing experiments as astronomers. You can't take a galaxy for yourself and watch how it changes over time. So we build simulations instead. Um, this means that we're often very envious of other types of scientists. For example, if, if, a, if a chemist wants to know what is the pH of a solution, then it can get a piece of litmus paper, they can drop it in there and they can do the experiment for themselves. But we can't do that as astronomers. Um, but the things that we're interested in are not so much things like the pH of a solution. Often we're interested in things like these. Um, these are different cosmological parameters. Basically, these are numbers that come up in our theories of how old the universe is, how quickly the universe is expanding, um, how much material there is in the universe. And these are all things that cosmologists in particular are really interested in learning about. Um, for example, this one in the top right, uh, this basically just describes how much matter there is in our universe. But these things are quite difficult to measure. And so using simulations, we can have a go at measuring these things. Um, these are some simulations that were made by a, a colleague of mine, Yuba, here at the University of Waterloo. And what these simulations are is several simulations, but using different values for these numbers, these, these parameters that describe the properties of the universe as a whole. And what he did is he ran a few different simulations with different numbers here. And you can see that the, the, the model universe, the simulated universes that he's made are all subtly different from each other. What we can do then is we can compare each of these universes, each of these simulated universes to our real universe. And which, whichever one of them matches best with the real universe gives us a bit of an idea of what are the values of these parameters in the actual universe that we live in. So this is kind of the closest we can get to doing experiments and to try and measure these things uh, in our universe. Simulations are really a really useful tool for that. The final thing that simulations are good for is to prepare us for the future. Um, I've got a, a few pictures of some different telescopes here. In the middle, we've got the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been around for a couple of decades now. We all know and love Hubble. Uh, on the left is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is hopefully going to start collecting data in the next couple of years or so uh, through a big survey called LSST. And then on the right is a picture of Louvois, which is a proposed space telescope that might be launching sometime in the 2030s. Now, what we can do with simulations is we can run a simulation, we can get some galaxies out at the end, but we can then plug into our simulations the properties of these different telescopes and figure out what would that galaxy look like if we were to view it through each of these different telescopes. 
And this is really, really useful for preparing for these new missions. Um, what I've got here is one galaxy taken from a simulation from the Vela suite of simulations. And this is what this galaxy would look like if you were to view it with the Hubble telescope in the middle. And then on the left, if you were to view it with the Vera Rubin telescope and on the right with Louvois. As you can see, these telescopes are all completely different, right? The, you can get pretty good detail with it with Hubble, but with Rubin LSST, you're not going to be able to get anywhere near as much detail. Uh, this isn't to say that LSST will be no good. It will be an amazing telescope for a bunch of different reasons. This is just not something it's well suited for. But this is useful information, right? This means that we know that the, this, this is the kind of data we're going to get out from LSST. And so we can prepare and we can think ahead of time. All right, how can we interpret this data? What is it that we can still learn, despite the fact that the resolution of this data isn't going to be quite what it is with Hubble? On the other end, you can see what this galaxy would look like if it was viewed through Louvois. And Louvois, if it gets launched, is going to be amazing, right? The, the quality of the images we'll get from this telescope will be absolutely mind-blowing, you know, way better than Hubble, which has been the gold standard for this kind of thing for decades. But again, this is useful preparation because we need to know, all right, this is the kind of data we're going to get through. How are we going to deal with this data? How are we going to process it? How are we going to interpret this incredibly detailed data? And so simulations are a really, really useful tool for this as well, I think. <clears throat> um, that's nearly everything that I've got that I wanted to say. Uh, but I want to play a little game just to, to finish up at the end. So you can see on the, on the right here, um, this is a, a, a galaxy taken from a simulation. And this just shows you the, the incredible quality of a lot of simulations in the present day. Some of these simulations are so good, they start to become a little bit difficult to distinguish from real life galaxies. And so that's why I want us to play Spot the Real Galaxy. I think Christian is gonna bring up some, some polls in a moment. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you pictures of two galaxies. One of them is a real galaxy that has been spotted through a telescope and is somewhere out there in space. And the other one is completely made up. It's an output from a simulation from a bunch of these packets of matter that have been flying around and have just been described inside a computer. Um, here's the first example, Christian, if you could launch the poll for this one, and I'll ask everyone to have a close look at these and vote for what you think is the real galaxy. It's a tricky one. I spent a lot of time on the internet finding a simulated and a real galaxy that looked nice and similar to each other. Uh, this is actually very difficult. It's, mm. it's not trivial. I, I ran these questions past a couple of my colleagues yesterday, and they had to have a really close look to try and figure out which one was real. Well, if they had a close look. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can. All right. Do you think that's time for everyone to have made their minds up? Yeah, well, uh, 15 more seconds. Give, give you a few more seconds. Give them a few more seconds. They're still, still coming in. Still coming okay. in. Okay. So. Uh, just let's give it exactly a minute and then we'll close it. Yeah. Okay. I will share with you what you think. All right. Most people have said so. 76% of people have said that A is the real galaxy. Um, well, that is interesting. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that 76% <laughs> of you are incorrect. Um, <laughs> Galaxy B is the real one. Galaxy A is from the Eagle simulation, which I, I showed a picture from earlier on. Let's try again. Let's try another one. Let's see if we can do any better this time around. Which of these galaxies is real? One of them is real. One of them is from a simulation. One second. Let's just, uh, let me don't just, sorry. I must, did I, one second. I, I have to, uh, one second, stop sharing. Okay, I see what I did wrong here. Okay, here oh. we go. Yes, okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, it really, it, it shows you how impressive a lot of these simulations are. You know, it's, it's very difficult to distinguish. Oh yes. From, oh yes. Oh yes. From real galaxies. As well, I want to point out, you know, these are not artists' impressions, right? You could get someone who's a very good artist who could sit down and draw a galaxy that looks realistic. There's no artistic talents that have gone into these. This is just maths and physics that have made these. And this is just the thing that has popped out with, with no human interpretation from our simulations, uh, which I think is a, 
a real testament to the people. Oh, who knows? Who Maybe those system. those fantasy galaxies sit somewhere out there. We just can't see them, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, say th this one. One of these is a is a pretend galaxy, but there clearly is a galaxy that looks pretty similar to it in real life. Yeah, this is very interesting. Okay, give it a few more seconds. Okay. Well, I'll put my vote in for B, and I may be completely wrong, but I have to do something because I really don't know. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> let's see. Okay, let's end the poll, share the results. All what right, a much more even split this time. So 60% yeah. of people have said B is real, 40% uh, have said A is real. Christian, you said B was real, didn't yes. you? Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid you're incorrect. Oh A is the real one. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, now you really. Now you now you blew me away. I thought I saw something <laughs> like that. Okay. okay. Well, let's try it. We've got, we've got one more. This is the last one I've got. Okay, um, one sec. Let's just get this one. Okay, last one. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I would I would immediately, but well, I'm not going to just wait for people. But I, I goodness me, I've, I've done so much astrophotography. I should... <laughs> I I've definitely got one. galaxies that were that were not too well known. I haven't got any messier objects in there because I thought for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are not. Uh, uh, but my tendency would, I mean, my spontaneous reaction is straight away A, but I may, I may be completely wrong, right? Again, so <laughs> I think. <laughs> this is just really interesting. Mm. So these these last two are both from a set of simulations called fire um which are really really amazing they do really good stuff okay i'm um, going to end the poll and i'll share with you here we go again okay oh i think people might have figured it out this time so 84 percent of people have said a for this one uh and you're absolutely right this time oh, a is the goodness. real galaxy so well, well done christian you got you got one of them right i was going to give up my 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 astrophotography <laughs> you know if i got this one wrong i would have said that's it i can't do this anymore <laughs> <laughs> so i think this is i mean this is a real you know this is a real demonstration of just how good these simulations have got now um yes if anyone if anyone identified all three of the real galaxies in that i'll be very impressed it was wow. uh, is there anybody, by the way, who got them all three right? I'm just curious. Put 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 yourself in the chat. I'm really curious to know. Right. We'll see. So I I ran this past a couple of my colleagues, and they spent a good few minutes staring at these images, trying to trying to find any features that would give it away. Oh, well, we got a few. George, Marion, nice to see you. John got them all right. That's great. Oh, look at that! Look at that! We have we have <laughs> Dietrich. My goodness, Anthony. Ag Agnes, Nisa, I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. Ron, Carlos got two. Neil got two. Good. Wow. Oh, there's a, there's two, a few smarties that know what they're doing. <laughs> amazing. You are amazing, really. <laughs> <laughs> Stunning. <laughs> Stunning. Okay, where to okay. next? Sure. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna finish up here. This is kind of my, my last thing to speak about, really. Um, I just want to spend a moment just kind of talking about where where this field of simulations is going next. Um, this is, I was trying to avoid put, putting graphs into talks because nobody really likes looking at a graph. But this is just showing the number of particles, the number of these packets of matter that have been in a whole bunch of simulations since the kind of birth of this field in the early 70s, right through to the present day. And you can see for yourself just how this, this field is growing exponentially, right? In the 1970s, we were talking about hundreds or maybe a few thousand particles interacting with each other. And now we're able to run simulations that have literally trillions of particles in them. Right? The, the, the jump forward in the last few decades has been astronomical in this field. Um, and that's why we're now able to, to produce such detailed simulations, right? It's now become feasible to simulate these individual clouds of gas within a galaxy. Uh, which means that we can look at star formation in different areas of the galaxy and really get such a detailed history of how these uh, these simulated galaxies form and evolve over time. If you sort of imagine, you know, continuing this trend along for another couple of decades, then we're going to start to get into really, really exciting territory. Um, if this trend continues for the next, say, 20 years or so, 
we could quite feasibly be at the point where we're able to simulate individual stars within a galaxy. So we'll be able to look at each of the stars that are flying around within this galaxy and how they interact with each other, uh, which again would just be such a huge jump forward in this field and would be able to give us such detailed ideas of the history of the galaxies and the real universe around us. Um, it's always, in my opinion, a little dangerous to extrapolate too far from these plots, but you can sort of imagine if this line continued for another couple of hundred years, then we would start to get into very weird territory. If this trend continued for another couple of hundred years, we'd start to get to the point where the number of particles in this simulation was approaching the number of atoms in the known universe. Now, if you can run a simulation where the people in the simulation are the same complexity as real life, would anyone in the simulation know they were in a simulation? I don't want to be that guy to say that we might all be living in a simulation, but I just think it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. It's food for thought. Um, obviously, that is all a, a little speculative, and I, I think we shouldn't get too carried away with that kind of thing. But the point is that the future is very bright for cosmological simulations. Uh, they're an incredibly useful tool for helping us understand the universe around us. And I think they're going to continue to be a, a really, really vital tool for astronomers for a long time to come. Um, I hope I've convinced everyone here of that as well, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions anyone's got. Thanks. <laughs>